by Annie Warrior Podcast, Episode 8, 100 Deadly Skills with Clint Emerson. All right, guys, and welcome to episode eight of the Bionic Warrior podcast. Once again, I am Guru Mike Panna, chief instructor and founder of the Bionic Warrior Martial Arts Academy, located right here in the sunny Dallas, Texas area. If this is your first time joining us on the Bionic Warrior podcast, our goal is to inspire and motivate our listeners to become the heroes in their life. We do this by interviewing experts in the fields of martial arts, self-defense, combatives, entrepreneurship, psychology, and much more. On today's podcast, we have Clint Emerson. Uh, Clint is a retired Navy SEAL as well as author of the books 100 Deadly Skills and 100 Deadly Skills Survival Edition. Clint was kind enough to sit down with me and discuss various strategies and tactics that can help us save ourselves and our families in these dangerous times. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this interview with Navy SEAL Clint Emerson. Um, So, Clint, welcome to the show. Um, We just want to know a little bit more about you. So if you don't mind giving us a little bit about yourself, uh, about your background, as well as what you're currently doing nowadays. Okay, great. Hey, Mike, thanks for having me. Um, Yeah, I was a SEAL for 20 years. And these days I am now running my own business doing crisis management consulting for, you know, Fortune 500 guys and smaller companies. Um, If you don't mind, uh, what inspired you to join the military? Was there anything in your upbringing that uh, inspired you to join the military? And uh, what lessons did you take away from your military service? Um, Yeah, inspiration probably was my, you know, my grandparents were both World War II guys. All my uncles were Vietnam guys. My dad, he tried, but his knees were all blown out from football, so they, you know, nobody would take him. Um, even though he was one of those guys that was actively signing up to go to Vietnam (laughs) and he wasn't waiting to be drafted, but when he did the medically, they're like, no way. Um, so, uh, those guys definitely are inspirational. Uh, and then also I've always, I was fascinated with, uh, the seal community ever since I was probably, you know, 10 years old and, uh, I'd met a seal, um, while traveling back to the States, um, uh, that was at the Frankfurt airport. Um, and it's actually kind of a funny story. I'll give you the short version. I meet this guy at the bar. I'm getting like a Coke, you know, cause I'm 10. Mm. I'm traveling by myself from Saudi. Cause that's where I grew up mm. back to the States for the Christmas holidays. Cause you can't celebrate Christmas inside the kingdom. Right. Uh, so my parents would just put me on a plane and let me go spend Christmas with my grandparents every year. Mm. So, we stop in Frankfurt to switch flights. I meet this guy. He's got, you know, uh, kind of a shorter beard, a ponytail. You know, he's got this tattoo that I asked about. I said, what's that tattoo of? And he's like, it's a trident. And I'm like, what's a trident? And he's like, it's a symbol. I said, what's a symbol of? And he's like, it's the Navy SEALs. Who are you, kid? Why are you asking me all these <laughs> questions? And so uh, That's awesome. he goes on to tell me, yeah, I'm – you know, I'm a seal. I'm like, well, what do seals do? And he said, well, uh, where do you, where are you coming from? I said, I'm coming from Saudi. He said, well, you know, we just bombed Libya, right? I'm like, yes. And he's like, okay, so the, Libya had anti-aircraft guns. We had B-111 bombers. In order for those B-111 bombers to get in nice and close and hit the targets accurately without collateral damage, me and my friends had to take out the anti-aircraft guns. And I was like, well, how'd you do that? And he goes. Well, four of us went in, and we shoot everybody at the anti-aircraft gun site, and then we blow up the gun. I was like, wow. That's what <laughs> I so I was sold from then on out. Now, here's the funny part. I show up to SEAL Team 3, and at the time, SEAL Team 3 was the like desert warfare mm-hmm. team. And all we did was you know, desert warfare, and our area of operation at the time was the Middle East. So I go into the command historian. I'm like, okay, did, was it, did we ever take out any aircraft guns mm. right before we bombed Libya back in the 80s? And they're like, nope. So my inspiration to become a SEAL and the guy <laughs> that motivated me probably was a fraud like most guys out there that say they're SEALs. Mm. And uh, that's kind of the funny ending there because there was uh, – yeah, I 
this guy who was probably actually a no one um, gave me a great story that stuck with me the rest of my life. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So you enlisted in the military and you went through buds. I'm sure you went through the entire process of being a SEAL. Uh, you know, what lessons did you take away uh, from your time as a SEAL? Well, 20 years, and there's a lot of lessons depending on what you're doing, where you're at, you know. So, I mean, overarching probably lessons um, is, you know, never take one day, one minute, one second for granted. Uh, always take take everything in. Be appreciative of everything you've got. Um, always, you know, tell your family and your closest friends that you love them as much as you can, uh, because you just never know when it's going to be the last day. And that's kind of gloomy, but really it, you know, it's, 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 it's more positive than it is negative. You just need to take it all in, be appreciative. Um, you know, uh, you know, that's how it relates to life and the people around you, I would say is a big lesson learned. Uh, but, uh, I mean, Discipline, you know, uh, there's there's so much that comes with that. The self-discipline side of the house, you know, McRaven's speech in his book, you know, make your bed. I can't. I mean, he he nailed it on the head. It's like you learn so much about yourself and you know how to get through certain you know crises or events in life or in combat or whatever it is that you know that balance is point number one, you know, and it's like, you know, being appreciative of everything that you got going on. So that's probably the biggest one. That's awesome. That's very powerful. And, uh, you know, I want to talk about a hundred deadly skills. I mean, this is really what you're known for, um, you know, to the wider public. Um, what inspired you, what motivated you to write these books and why did you choose to target the civilians, uh, civilian market for this? Um, well, first I, when I was getting out, I've been out, I've been retired out of the Navy for probably two years. So before I got out, you know, I put together my business plan for Escape the Wolf, which is crisis management for, you know, large to small companies. Um, and as I started doing that, I was building all these best practices for these companies. I was like, well, how, how do I deliver, you know, good best practices for, you know, the consumer, the average person? And then that's where 100 Deli Skills manifested from was, okay, I want, yeah, I'm giving employees all this great stuff. Well, how do I give it to everyone else that may not be working for a company that's that proactive when it comes to safety and security? Mm. So 100 Deli Skills. And the goal is really over, 100 Deli Skills is all about getting people to be more self-reliant, more self-rescue oriented. Um, and with today's events, everyone needs to understand that they are a first responder, right? We are all first responders. We're not, we're calling 911, but we're also augmenting the first response organizations that are coming to your rescue. So there is a section of people that are naturally going to be, you know, a, an a, a counter attacker if, 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 if a gunman comes into whatever restaurant, the mall, the baseball field, wherever you're at, there's going to be a section of people that are going to be, I'm going to kill that guy. Mm. And I want to touch those people. I want them to know with the hundred deli skills and everything else I've got going on. Yeah, exactly. So one little section of you are going to go on the attack mode. If you're a concealed carry guy, then you've got your gun and you're going to shoot the dude. If you've got a, a fixed blade weapon or a folder, whatever it is, you're going to use it. Mm. Uh, maybe you just have, you know, a zebra pen or whatever else you're mm. going to go on the attack. Some people are not in a position to do that may not have the confidence. So the other group of first responders are, you know, know how to stop bleeding. They're putting pressure above the gun sight or the gunshot wound. They're putting pressure on the gunshot hmm. and then they're applying a tourniquet because you don't want to just always go straight to the tourniquet. I mean, it's uh, sometimes that isn't necessary. And once you apply it, you know, it's a, uh, anyway, it leads to a lot, but that is really the ultimate goal is self-rescue, self-reliance. Everybody is a first responder we just all have different jobs within that response based on our capabilities or confidence. Oh, um, have you ever considered teaching this uh, past the book, maybe uh, offering seminars on 100 Deadly Skills or maybe like a weekend course or something like that? Yeah, I've actually planned it all out, but I haven't executed on dates or anything like that just yet. 
probably leveraging guys like you, um, studios and gyms, like what you have, letting them host it and doing it in those types of environments with their clientele. No, that'd be awesome. I would totally be down for that. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, that, sounds yeah. like a, that sounds like a lot of fun. And so going through your books, you know, I noticed uh, one of the things that really struck me, one of the topics that you talk about, I think, I believe it's in your first book, um, the concept of the violent nomad workout. And I saw your latest video, which I thought was really cool. It was uh, you in your backyard working out. Uh, great backyard setup, by the way. Um, awesome backyard <laughs> yeah. setup. I, I'm totally in love with that setup. Um, and I, you know, I found it very interesting. You have all these really cool, you know, Jason Bourne type skill sets in these books. But one of the first things that you talk about is this workout. Uh, why is it that you feel that physical fitness is important to be a violent nomad or to be a more self-reliant individual? Well, I, th I think we all, I think most people agree. And if they don't, then they just don't know what they don't know is human performance is the first step to getting yourself out of any kind of crisis issue or threat. And on top of that, being physically fit and, and working out and doing you know, whatever it takes to be in shape. Um, it, yeah, it helps you to be more self-reliant, self-rescue oriented, but also help your family, your friends. You should be able to carry people depending on the crisis. And I'm not always talking about bad guys. When I say crisis, it could be natural disaster. It could be anything that, you know, we potentially face every day, depending on where you are in the world. So yeah, fitness is like one of the first pieces to being self-reliant, self-rescue, and be able to take care of yourself, move when you need to move, fight when you need to fight, um, and do it in a manner that, you know, you know, 10 feet later, you're not huffing and puffing, you know, and throwing up. You need to be able to, you know, yeah. put it put out and not be exhausted. No, absolutely. And if you don't mind, could you discuss the and explain the violent nomad workout? Sure. So I've, I've put a couple of samples and they can be um, used and then you can grow upon these workouts, but really it's a run fight run concept. So, you know, these days, yeah, we all want to engage maybe in some kind of a fight and, you know, or we don't want to engage in it, but we don't want to stay in it. Like it's Kung Fu theater for five minutes straight. That's just unrealistic. Right. The goal is create pain or do something so that you can increase distance away from that threat. Um, and increasing distances with the running. So all of my workouts start with a, you know, some kind of a push, pull, strike, you know, and then a sprint. So you got to, you know, some kind of a push exercise, some kind of a pull exercise, um, different striking exercises, which the beauty of, as you know, with striking, it's actually a rotation, right? Because you're using your core to deliver different kinds of blows. And then it's followed up by a sprint. Um, and this, what this does is it conditions anyone so that they can fight and still have the gas to run. Mm -hmm. And then if they happen to run into another bad guy, let's say a hundred yards away, they still got enough gas to fight and then run and then fight, then run. And that's pretty much the general concept. So in terms of some of the topics in 100 Deadly Skills, um, one of the things that really struck out to me, you talk about EDC. Um, I know there's a lot of listeners here who are kind of getting into the concept of an everyday carry. Uh, could you kind of go into that portion and explain what it means to have an everyday carry and uh, some suggested items uh, that could be put in an EDC? Yeah, so you're right. Everyday carry is becoming more and more popular, and it, it really goes back to you know the you, different variations depending on the environment you're in. So everyday carry, which you, what I would call first line gear, you know the gear, the stuff that you carry that's closest to your body or closest to your skin, could include what you wear depending on the environment. I'm a big believer that you should you know always wear shoes you can either fight or run in. You know sandals, flip flops, and high heels never do anybody any good when it when crisis strikes pants, you know, uh, yeah, I, it's hot. You know, we start wearing shorts, but if you know, you're going to be going to a certain environment that, you know, could lead to, you know, a, a good day going bad, you know, pants, cause they, they cover you up pants that you can run in, you know, obviously fight in, mm -hmm. uh, you never know when you mind up, you know, crawling, it could be any kind of natural disaster. You're going to want that extra layer of protection. Um, so EDC is, is includes clothing is the is the point. It also includes the immediate things you might need. So it could be carrying, you know, a concealed pistol, a handgun of some sort. It could be carrying a straight blade. Um, you know, different states. Maybe all you're going to be able to carry is a you know a folder of some sort that's in your pocket, clipped to your the inside of your pocket, or clipped to the, your inside of your waistband. Um, and then you've got you know 
I like messenger bags, man bags. You know, I got into the habit of carrying one everywhere I went. Inside that, you want to have, you know, life support, right? That's, you know, you always want to have some water on you, no matter what you're doing, where you're going, where you're traveling. Um, a little bit of food, you know, I always go with, hey, 24 hours is a good time frame because in urban, in any urban world you're in, you know, you're going to be able to get to food and water, hopefully within 24 hours. Now, if you're going rural, your EDC changes, right? Mm -hmm. So now you're increasing to, you know, three days of different stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what you carry on you changes. So that's your first line gear. It's all the stuff you carry on you to maintain life support, includes cash and credit cards, you know, and then it means of escape. I'm big on this, you know, every soul inside the – most of my shoes, I've already had a handcuff key and a razor blade there for years. Mm. You put them in there and you forget about them, but you always know you have them. So if you find yourself, you know, taped up with your hands in front or behind you, you've got a razor blade that can cut through tape, rope, tie ties. If – now the modern day bad guy, they're buying handcuffs right off the internet. So if you find yourself in handcuffs, whether it's by a bad guy or a corrupt law enforcement system somewhere in the world, then you can get the handcuff. You know, your peerless, you know, handcuffs, it's the same key unlocks all of them. Now they're starting to have variations out there, but for the most part, if you buy a handcuff key, it's going to work on 99% of the handcuffs that get put on your wrists around the globe. So that's, that's kind of your first line stuff. And then of course, I think each vehicle, you should have a bolt bag of some sort. Um, and then in course at home and at work, you know, if you work in a cubicle farm setting and we're sitting at your desk right now, you should have a little bag down at your feet that you can grab. If there's a building fire, if there's an earthquake, whatever, and it has some things in there that support, um, survivability. And that's really the goal of EDC and all of these different types of bolt bags we see out there on Instagram and everywhere else. Awesome. Awesome. And I noticed in your books, uh, you actually mentioned the concept of body armor. Uh, you talk about, you talk about, uh, improvised body armor, which I'd like to know a little more about, but in addition to that, you also recommend bulletproof clipboards. So I'm kind of curious as to, uh, you know, why you included this in the books, um, as well as some of your experience, how effective uh, these makeshift or everyday uh, versions of these shields are. Yeah, so, I mean, the intent behind improvised body armor is just that you, you're, you're traveling. Obviously, you're not going to travel with body armor in your suitcase. Um, it's for the person who might be, you know bad place, wrong time, <laughs> you hear yeah. gunshots fired, or you're in a hotel that's being taken over. I mean, you look at uh, Mumbai attacks, it included a hotel. I mean, you look at a lot of these attacks, they, they either, either it's a hotel or it's a place of, you know, where a lot of people mass, right? So, um, and in thinking, you know, it's like, all right, what can I use that's around me? You know, hotel rooms all over the world still have Bibles and Korans in the drawers. You can put those things together and it'll stop almost, almost all handguns um, without a doubt. I've tested them all. You know, if you take, you know, Bibles, it's interesting. The paper that they're made out of increases the density because they're so thin, but each is a, is a separate layer. Um, the same thing goes for, you know, encyclopedias, any of your hardback books, mm -hmm. Um, to stop a handgun, two books, two hardback books put together um, can stop most handgun rounds. And if you look at today's active shooter, it includes handguns and high, you know, and rifles. Mm -hmm. Most of these guys are carrying. Right. Um, to stop a rifle round, you've got to increase, you know, your awareness of what's around you at that point. So that's identifying big planters, um, you know, structural pillars, concrete walls, not sheetrock, you know, you so now you're identifying these other, you know, uh, other ballistic resistant items around you. Now, when you move into like something you can buy off the internet, they have, um, different ballistic proof, um, clipboards that are out there. And the first generation that I tested were very heavy and cumbersome, mm -hmm. you know, but you could put them into your bag, travel, even carry it, and it looks like a clipboard, you know. Right. Um, and you can slide it into like if you use one of those big day planners, you know, that unzip portfolio style. You can slide that clipboard into there. You can slide it into your um, laptop briefcase or wherever. You can put them wherever you want. But now as time has gone on and in, in these some of these plates – 
have become, you know, level four t- type plates that have are now a lot lighter and they stop rifle rounds. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you can put these things and they make them in all sizes and shapes these days. And so really it's just getting people to think a little more outside the box, not be paranoid, you know, identify some products that could potentially be part of your everyday carry. Um, and if you find yourself in a situation like a bunch of congressmen playing baseball, or you find yourself on a train in Europe, at least you've got some stuff with you that blends into the environment, but also protects you. Absolutely. And I, I know that you also discuss uh, active shooters in your books. Uh, I'm, I would like you to, if possible, to discuss uh, your approach uh, to teaching the everyday civilian how to handle an active shooter. I believe you call it run, hide, and fight, if I'm correct. Yes. So it's really a mantra that's really easy. Let's face it. When you're under stress, you know, micro motor skills aren't going to work. That's why the Jason Bourne fight never works for anybody unless you do it eight hours a day every day. So you, if you're doing it all the time, great, apply it. That's fine motor skills. Mm-hmm. But we tend to have to rely on macro motor skills. So you, you, these are the things that under stress will still work effectively. So um, the mantra run, hide, fight is it's you don't have to use it in that order. These are choices mm-hmm. depending on where you are. So the first piece to this is being more aware before shots are fired. So if I'm at a restaurant, if I'm at the mall, if I'm traveling abroad, then I'm going, okay, where can I run right now? It's not about just identifying exits. It's literally going, where am I? Yeah, I I see that exit, but can I get to that exit in a timely manner if shots are fired um, with all these people in here? So you have to be realistic, right? So run. In my head, I'm going, where can I run effectively? Okay. Now, if I can't get to that door effectively, then where am I going to hide? And I want to hide behind things that stop bullets. So you identify those things. Then if neither one of those things really are there, then you know, okay, well, I'm left with fighting. So what kind of improvised weapons are around me that I can leverage to fight, right? What can I use that causes pain? You know, okay, salt and pepper burns the eyes. A salt and pepper shaker, I can hunk it at someone, it's probably gonna hurt. But you're creating pain so that it opens up the door for the run or the hide. Um, But all of these are choices, but there are three easy choices. You don't want it complicated because complicated and complex, just it just doesn't work when you're under stress unless you're working in an environment where you're always under stress, then you're going to be good at it. But for the normal average person, this isn't something they're doing all the time, right? They're not fighting every day for eight hours or, you know, or they're not a special operations guy that's around the globe fighting or sneaking up on bad guys on a regular basis. So run, hide, fight, everything you do everywhere you're at. Now, Here's the beauty of it. When crisis strikes, what's the mantra that you're going to follow? Run, hide, fight. Now you're acting out the decisions you've already made because the last thing you want to do is make decisions under stress. They can sometimes be the right one, but there's a majority of situations where you'll make the wrong decision under stress Mm -hmm. and then you'll end up either injured or dead. So... Run, hide, fight before everywhere you go. You're always asking yourself run, hide, fight questions. And then if it happens, you're ready to act those decisions out. Excellent, excellent. And so since you're speaking of the fight as being the last part of that mantra, I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. I've, I, I follow you on Instagram. That's kind of how we connected. Um, you know, I've read your books. I've seen your videos. Um, do you currently do any martial arts training uh, to augment your, your skill base? Um, I know you obviously have your training through the military, through the Navy SEAL community. Uh, but, you know, do you do any type of martial arts training or any weapons training outside of what you're teaching 100 Deadly Skills? Uh, personally for myself, I, yeah, I shoot every Wednesday with my daughter, you know, I'm trying to make her good, you know, better than me. She's 13. She's getting there. Um, and then as far as I, I used to do all back when, you know, before I came in the Navy, Gracie was, you know, he was the star. I know he's still the star. So, you know, grappling and jujitsu stuff I did all the way up through college. Then when I came in, um, it's interesting, the SEAL community with body armor on and stuff, it's a totally different kind of uh, fighting, if you will. Um, I've always loved, like, the Filipino style because it, it starts, you know, for me, I did a little bit of stick work, you know, back in the day. Um, 
was it the Heavenly Seven? And what it was, I forgot all the terms that who I learned from use. But anyway, that flow. And now you take the sticks out of your hand, and now you you you're the same flow is with whether it's a knife, whether it's your fists. And I appreciated that the the British flag concept, you know, with mm. where to strike and where to stick, you know, um, is something that's been with me ever since that too. So, and I've heard it from lots of different people. You know, so I mean, there's a lot of influence I've had over the years, is my point. But <laughs> with doing all of that, my joints are, you know, just that career alone has made my destro- my 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 joints are basically destroyed. Right. So now I keep it kind of safe, and I I box every morning. Nice. Um, that one, cr- crazy enough, boxing doesn't hurt as much as like getting on the ground and rolling around as I think we all know. So I've, uh, I've pulled off the grappling and I'm more of a, you know, concentrating on striking. Let's face it. A hundred percent of your fights start while you're standing up. Mm-hmm. 95% of them will end up on the ground. Me, I want to be the 5% that's just still standing and runs away. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good plan. <laughs> yeah. Cause so concrete 100% hurts. <laughs> of the time it's going to yeah. start when you're on your feet 90 fight, go to the ground. I'm going to be part of the 5% that's still on my feet. And that's, that's what I'm sworn to now. <laughs> <laughs> I dig that. I really dig that. I really dig that. Now, I, I want to talk about Escape the Wolf. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. Um, I know it's your company. If you don't mind kind of going in-depth with what that is and what the mission of Escape the Wolf is. Yeah, our goal, mission, you know, that's on the website is bridging the gap between crisis and the unknown. And we do that through policy development, um, training, and, you know, program development. So those are our big three buckets. If we come into a company, a lot of companies will say, yep, we're covered. But when you really look at them, they've got a workplace violence policy that's been sitting on the shelf for 10 years and really doesn't apply anymore. Mm. Or they say they got active shooter covered, but when you really dig into it, it involves, it's more of a response plan than it is giving employees the skills they need. And so it's, it's a matter – we go into companies and we really assess their policies, their best practices, and then we update them with current best practices or best practices that are tailored to their culture or the environment they work in every day. And then we educate the workforce via videos and e-learning that um, is – you know, very interactive and entertaining because if it's not entertaining, then people just click through it just to get over it and move on with their work day. So um, everything we do is custom and tailored to the company's needs and requirements. Oh, excellent, excellent. And I, this is based out of the DFW area, if I'm not mistaken. Right, correct. And But we have clients, you know, all over the country, Some and even some is, nor, you know, like Canada. We've done work for a lot of different companies, both U.S.-based and internationally. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so we're running down on time, um, and I like to ask all of my interviewees this question. Uh, Mr. Emerson, in your opinion, what does it mean to be a hero? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say doing something for the greater good uh, that's not about you. It's selfless. Um, I think that's probably uh, the biggest characteristic of a hero, you know, it's, it's the opposite of selfish. It's the opposite of ego. It's, uh, it has everything to do with, uh, you know, thinking outside of yourself and doing something great that helps others and affects others' lives in a positive way. Excellent. That's that very powerful stuff, sir. Thank you. And, uh, Mr. Emerson, thank you so much for coming on to our show today. Uh, is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with before you go? Uh, no, other than, hey, be more preemptive in thought, be more proactive in action, and hopefully we can all get ahead of the different types of threats and violence we see these days. And I appreciate you having me on. I know. Thank you so much, sir, for taking the time to talk to us today. And uh, we definitely look forward to hearing more from you soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Take thank care, buddy. You. Thank you, sir. All right, guys, I really hope you enjoyed Episode 8 of the Binding Warrior Podcast. I look forward to seeing you at Episode 9. Take care, God bless, and be the hero in your life.